Hi. <laughs> um, I'm really happy to be here, to be grilling you with questions. I hope you're ready. Softball, um, softball. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I don't think your work needs an introduction, but I'm actually amazed that this year you have five films coming out, Midnight Special, which just premiered, Night of Cups, that's out in the theater. Yeah. yeah. Um, Weightless. Yeah, this is not dated yet, but it's done. Yeah. Might be out any minute now. Keep an eye. Yeah. Voyage of Time. Voyage of Time. Another Terrence Malick film. This one's a uh, an IMAX documentary. Looks like fall in the IMAX world. And then Jeff's new film, Loving. Yeah, Loving is going to be done pretty soon as well. It could be any minute. So how do you do it? <laughs> it's very interesting because I can't say I shot them all at the same time. Uh, Voyager Time, for instance, Terry's been working on it since the 70s and I've been working on it since I've known him, which is you know, nigh on 15 years now. So, um, you know, we shot the two features, um, Night of Cups and Weightless back to back. So those are unsurprisingly on top of each other. Um, and yeah, it just kind of, you know, we shot Midnight Special a couple of years ago, and this was just the right release date for it. Um, again, we're not dated on Loving, but you know, we're gonna be done. We shot it last fall, and it's coming together very smoothly, so I don't anticipate a big wait for that either. Um, so this is a fun year, so no production, but a lot of release. So, um, you have basically created your own brand of a creative producer. You are the Sarah Green brand. And, you know, one of just, you know, trying to prepare for this interview, um, you know, I read some of your interviews and uh, some of the pieces on you. And the one word that always come up, comes up is tenacity. So, and you are, you know, just by someone meeting you personally, you know, you just feel the tenacity and the passion. So I would like to take us a bit uh, back in time and sort of like following a bit your journey from Emerson College. You can start earlier if you want, but nope. I, I know that it's, to me, it's really interesting because you actually set out to, to be a cinematographer. I did, indeed. I, I failed miserably. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so can you, can you walk us through? Because it's actually a quite fascinating journey. Sure. Um, so I was studying engineering, as all good producers must, and um, <laughs> <laughs> and I moved to a city. And I had, you know, grown up in a small town with no movie theater, so movies were not a part of my life until college. And I went kind of crazy. I became that person who never left the movie theater. Um, there were some really good repertory theaters in Boston, so they were showing old movies as well as current movies. And some of the most amazing filmmakers were coming of age then. It was late 70s, and I just fell in love. And I was sitting there trying to keep up my studies in engineering, and just how many movies could I squeeze in a day and think about and talk about? So I finally got smart and dropped out of engineering school and, um, <laughs> <laughs> and just started trying to figure out how to be in the movie business somewhere, somehow. And I did, I had this brilliant, logical <clears throat> idea that with my kind of math, left brain skill set, uh, that perhaps I could be a technician, which, you know, made sort of sense. But all I wanted to be was an artist. Like, I valued artists. I valued painters and writers and directors and actors and musicians. And I couldn't do any of those things. I still can't. Um, but I just knew that's what I loved. And I thought, well, perhaps I can get in, squeeze in the door with my, you know, my techno brain and uh, and maybe become an artist if I got really lucky and you know be a cinematographer. So I trained for two years as, as an electrician. I did finish school at Emerson. And then I moved to New York and apprenticed under Nancy Shriver, who some of you may know. She's an extraordinary cinematographer, the first woman in the union as a gaffer and then first as a director of photography. And uh, it was an amazing lesson because I learned everything, I, I learned all the technical side of it and I didn't have the eye for the creative side of it. And I really saw that, it was one day and I'll, I'll never forget the sort of, oh my, 
you know, I'll never get past the technician stage, which is a perfectly great place to be, but not where I wanted to go. So um, I stopped, started, they did everything you can do in a movie set. I've pulled focus, I've done sound, I've driven the trucks, I've gotten the food, <laughs> I've dressed people, I've, you know, propped, yeah, I've, I've done everything you can do, and then yeah, I finally fell into a really ambitious feature documentary, um, which was multi-city, multi-camera, really complicated, and it was being um, produced by the same person who was also directing it, and the production started to fall apart by about the second city, and I just stepped in and started organizing it, figuring it out, and doing all that part of it, and realized, ah, that's what I can do, you know? So I became a production person, and then I worked my way very slowly from production manager to line producer to producing, and ultimately really creatively producing. Um, I've kind of lost the whole skill set that I came in with, which is a good thing. So when you say you moved from producing to creative producing, could you, could you describe the main difference? Sure, I mean, it's, producing is always, you know, once you move past the line producer stage, that's much more sort of, again, organizational and running things. Um, producing, you have to have a business side, and I fortunately I had very good teachers, uh, Maggie Renzi being one of the principal teachers who really gave me my first producing job alongside her, asked me to partner with her on, um, which is the first one we did, City of Hope, with John Sayles' movie. And um, so I learned about raising money, which is a big part of it. I learned about putting deals together, both in terms of financing, but also the principal talent. Um, and then I learned over some years, not right away, but it took a little while to understand how big a part of uh, producing the um, distribution and marketing side is. So I enjoy all those pieces of it, and I, I love the business, and I'm good at it. But over time, I've also really embraced, I've gotten good at the creative side of it. And that's not to say I could write a script to save my life, but I'm a good editor. I'm a good, I know when something itches, and I don't necessarily know what to do, but I can say that piece, you know, and I can discuss it, and I work with, I love working with writers and writer-directors. I find that great fun. And I love being on set, which, you know, some people would consider, why would you spend all that time on set? But I love it because... I sit back and I'm, if I'm doing my job well, I'm actually not wildly busy. I'm, things should be running smoothly. I'm there to troubleshoot. But a lot of what I'm doing is just sitting back and watching and having a different perspective. You know, I'm not the one in the, I'm not the director. I'm not in the trenches. So I'm watching what we're shooting in the monitor. I'm just observing everything that's going on. And sometimes I can, you know, um, address problems before they even happen or the director may come back to me and say, you've been watching that, what do you feel about this or that? And I will have an answer. So that's a great deal of fun for me. Mm -hmm. um, so you have worked with only directors who have very distinct voices and um, very meaningful worldviews. Um, and I, you know, I can't really think of other producers who have actually been so focused in terms of um, really choosing, you know, the kind of, not, not just the sort of like the directors, but the kind of, you know, cinema as being um, a great, a, a conduit for very important worldview. So how did you, uh, how do you, how do you get paired up with your directors? How do you choose them? How do they choose you? How do you make that really important decision? You know, our life is quite limited, so every decision really matters. Indeed. Yeah. So it seems that, you know, you've been very st strict with yourself in terms of, you know, making the right choices and not spreading yourself too thin or not actually dedicating your energy and vision and generosity in and skill in movies that don't matter to you. <clears throat> I think I learned pretty quickly and early on um, how all-encompassing this work is. It it's to do it the way I prefer to do it. It's it's really full on, and so it's it's years of my life each project, and I'm very. Uh, I work very, very closely with the director and, and the other team players, the other producers, any other, you know, the, a lot of us, you know, we work really tightly together. So I, 
knowing how much time I'm going to be dedicated, I learned very quickly you need, I needed to care tremendously because I need to keep my energy up for it. It's years. You know, nothing takes place like that. It's mm -hmm. conceiving, developing, financing, packaging, you know, shooting, cutting, selling, uh, distributing, mm -hmm. and all those pieces. It's a long haul. So the picture had to matter because afterwards you don't want to sit there and go, well, you know, um, and and I I also it's it's you're so close. The people matter tremendously, and I was just really lucky when I started. I had a few people who took you know really took me under their wing and mentored me. Another one was when I was learning to be a production manager. Peggy Reisky, who's an extraordinary producer, but Star also started out as a production manager. We just met socially and we just liked each other. And she knew I was flailing around trying to fake it, you know, trying to figure out how to do the job on the run. And having f production manage my first feature, which I got for no good reason other than the director, producer, financier decided that he probably could trust me. I'm not sure why. And I think I had, I think he liked that I had less experience than everyone else there. So I probably didn't have, wasn't smart enough to rip him off. And um, <laughs> so, I got this job that I was highly unqualified for. I didn't, I'd never actually been on a feature set before, and I got a production managing job on a feature film. And um, I was flailing my way through it, calling Peggy constantly, you know, asking, "Well, it, it's you know this point in production, and this or this point in pre-production, and here I am, and this is what I thought about, and this is what's happening, and what am I not thinking of?" And she was just very reassuring. But after that, when she realized how incredibly un you know, experienced I was, she said, well, I'm going to go off and do, you know, a whopping big three and a half million dollar movie. Mine was under a million. And um, I need, I'm going to produce it and production manager. I need an assistant production manager. And I know you're beyond that already, but there's a job for you if you're interested. And it was with John Sayles. And I was like, oh yeah. First off, <laughs> a great writer director who made movies that matter, a lovely person. Peggy, I adored, and you know, I was so excited, and I and I had learned how much I had to learn, so it was a, I was thrilled to just take a step back and learn from somebody who actually knew what they were doing, um, and uh, and then work with good people. So after that, I was art, I was starting to line produce on other things. It was a great series that employed a whole bunch of us itinerant New Yorkers at the time called uh, what was it? I can't remember. It was oh, it was. Oh, it was called American Playhouse, and it was it was film versions of plays, but hopefully done in a really movie fashion. So I was working on those and line producing them, and actually produced one. And then Peggy called me again and said, uh, "Okay, I'm doing another John Sayles film, and it's a little bit bigger, and Eight Men Out, and but you still get the same job. You know, you have to be assistant production manager if you want to do this." And I was like, "Once again, good people." Good movie, good script, mm -hmm. yeah, mm. you know, because I, I was again, I was kind of cutting my teeth on these other things, but as soon as I realized that who it was and family, it really developed my understanding of how important family is and how important working with the same people is because you just, you develop such trust and understanding. The work goes so much smoother and is much more fun. And as you can see, I keep repeating the word fun because I wouldn't do this if it wasn't fun. It's way too hard. If you don't love it, run away. Um, how did you pick the, the, was it the first film that you full on produced by yourself? Was it Girl Fight by Karen Krisama? No, it was the first one I got a full producing credit on that was an independent feature as opposed to one of those American Playhouses, which was more geared for television, was um, City of Hope, which was oh. um, mm -hmm. what happened after Eight Men Out, um, is that Peggy decided to move on from her partnership with Maggie Renzi, who's John Sills's longtime producer and life partner. And um, Maggie asked me to step in and produce with her, which was you know, a wild step up and something, once again, highly unqualified for. Uh, <laughs> I was barely a line producer, and I got this job producing it. But Maggie liked having a mentee, she liked teaching, so I was like, I'll, I'll follow your lead anywhere. And of course, <laughs> it, was, it was kind of uh, ironic because, um, so this is the City of Hope. I think we budgeted it around $3 million. And it was this time when, I'm gonna date myself here, home video was going crazy and was driving the market in independent film. And so we raised the money by selling the home video rights to Sony like ahead of time. And we sat down, Larry, 
I just based on his last name, lovely guy who was running the sort of indie world there. And I, we sat down to lunch with him, Maggie Renzi, Larry, and myself. Maggie pitched the project, you know, John Sales, um, you know, these actors, this budget. And he said, yes, good. And I thought, wow, this is really easy. <laughs> I'm good at this. <laughs> Can I do everything over lunch? Like, that's really good. And they paid. You know? <laughs> he picked up the tab. It, was, it couldn't have gotten better. And it was kind of a rude awakening as I realized it's not always that easy. Has it ever happened before in like two seconds? Uh, it's certainly not happened since, no. <laughs> Um, so what happens when the pitch doesn't go well um, and you really believe in the film, you believe in your director, um, but there are all these obstacles? What do you do? How do you deal with it? There are always obstacles because there's so many moving parts to a picture. You know, We've talked about all the stages, but then there's within each stage there's a million people in a million departments, particularly in production, that's just a you know, minefield of potential problems. But once again, I learned um, there's a lot of people around you. You don't have to, I don't have to solve it myself. I often have producing partners that I can discuss it with. You know, what's one of the reasons that uh, working over and over with a director is really important um, because that trust develops and we can talk together about what priorities are and when problems happen, where we should put our focus and where, what we can let go of. And as long as I trust them to tell me the truth of that, and it becomes very easy. My job becomes really simple. Plus, there's just so many other good people around. It's like, you know, we're, we're surrounded by the designer and the DP and the editor and, you know, the costume people and the, all these people, and they're all smart and they're all filmmakers. And so... There's always people to help you solve your problems. I've never been stuck. You know, it's just we turn to the group and we go, okay, this is what's happened, and you know, somebody has a good solution. Mm -hmm. So you yourself have said have said many times that it's very important to um, to mentor. Mm -hmm. So mentorship as a as a as a method, as a value of creativity, as a um, uh, as a way of working, of passing along knowledge, can you can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. I mean, I'm just such a product of it. I was so lucky. I had one mentor after another. You know, I had a. But also because you invited them to be your mentors, and oh, you, absolutely. And yeah. you wanted, you know, you liked this experience, so it was not like okay. I know everything now, I'm ready to produce, I'm gonna do it on my own, I'm gonna make lots of money. You know, in a way you, you still invite mentors every day in your life and you return the mentorship. So it's, it's part of your method. Yeah, I mean, it's less lonely, you know, it's more fun when you have somebody you can really work with and learn from and, you know, yeah, now I, um, partners I work with now who come at it with the same experience I do. We're constantly learning from each other and bouncing ideas off each other. You know, um, I have this, this partner on my, the Terrence Malick films I do who's much younger than me, and he came on as an intern driver on the New World and just quickly proved himself to be super smart, super invaluable. I watched him and I was like, ah, he knows, he totally gets it. He makes himself invaluable. And then, and he's there to learn, and he's there to help. And b by the next movie, he was an associate producer, and the next one we produced together. So, and it's been such a good partnership because one of the things we do, both, and it's, it's both to sort of make sure we aren't moving without the other, because I was gotten, I'd sort of gotten used to producing alone at a certain point, and I was used to just running with things. And he wanted to make sure he was in the loop, and then. You know, I, we, it sort of became, went both ways. So what we do all the time, and we still do this, is when there's an important question to be answered or an important issue to be addressed, one of us will write a draft of an email and we'll just, you know, in the subject line, it will say draft and then whatever it is, and then we'll remind each other draft and then we'll write it out and then the other one will edit. And then we send it, and we might go back and forth once, not at all, or five times until we both feel like it's saying what it's meant to say in a way that will be heard by that person that needs the information or needs to answer the question. And it's so useful. I love it. I try to get all my partners to do it with me. I'm like, you know, some people pick up on it, some don't. Mm -hmm. uh, 
so going down the, the journey, um, you were working mostly um, up north on the East Coast, most of your projects. So suddenly you got a phone call mm -hmm. to come down to Texas. How did that happen? <laughs> um, I was driving. It was back in the <laughs> days of the flip phone, and I had it in my little cradle in the car. <laughs> and uh, this literally, my phone rang, and I answered. I'm on 128 in Gloucester, Massachusetts, where I live. And this per voice says, is this Sarah Green? I said, yes. And he says, this is um, Ter Terrence Malick. <laughs> I said, Terrence Malick, the filmmaker? <laughs> He said, uh, yes, and then I started to squeal, and you know, <laughs> to his credit, he didn't hang up on me as I pulled the car over to the side of the highway so I could take a breath. And um, he told me that, that a mutual friend, Michael Barker, who runs Sony Pictures Classics, had suggested me to him when he was talking about the way he wanted to work, and um, that no one quite felt that was realistic or viable or smart. And um, Michael knew me enough to know that I'm like a rabid Terrence Malick fan. And you know, his two movies in the 70s made me want to make movies, made me want to, I mean, they're just, they're the, two of the most important films, I think, out there. And, um, and I had actually considered, I had once confided in Michael that there was a big Vanity Fair article some time during the 20 years that Terry went missing after those first two. And I remember reading it thinking, I'm going to find this guy and I'm going to write him a letter and I'm going to tell him you know, who I am and ask him what I can do to help him make a movie because I need more Terrence Malick films in the world, which I never did. I just thought a lot about it. And, uh, and then he calls me up, so it was kind of great. We talked forever, and then I called Michael and going, Woo! and he said, <laughs> he said, yeah, I didn't want to warn you because I thought it'd be more fun. I was like, I'm going to kill you now. Uh, so yeah, so then we made, uh, we actually spent a year getting to know each other. It was a very slow process. I was doing other things. He had another producer that, on a project that might have happened first. But I just started helping him. I was just like, whatever I can do to help you, I don't need a credit, I don't need money, I don't need anything but to watch another of your movies. And, uh, and after a good period of time in which it seemed like another one was going to happen, he handed me a script and said, do you want to do this with me? And, uh, and it ended up going into the first position, and that was The New World. So then I came down here during post to check in, as I often do, thinking I'd be going back home momentarily. And then I got to know Terry and his world, which is quite all-encompassing, and ended up sort of never leaving. Um, and then you started working with Jeff, another visionary filmmaker, different generation, um, Austin, Texas. How did, how did it happen? He was here, but I didn't know him, and we hadn't crossed paths at all. But um, we have a mutual friend uh, called Brian Cavanaugh Jones, who was a CIA agent at the time. He was actually in the finance department, which is how I knew him. He was worked under Rick Hess, which is an old, old friend of mine at CIA. And uh, he kept telling me, there's this young filmmaker, and he's really smart, and you should meet him. And he's really he's made a first movie, and it, he made it for whatever, Twenty, thirty thousand dollars, and and I'm like, I'm like, run away, run away. <laughs> no, 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 I don't need that. And uh, uh, he kept saying, no, he's worth it. And I kept putting him off. And then, because uh, I was, you know, Terry's a full time job. And uh, and then I, there was a DVD that CIA had sent me of Shotgun Stories, which is Jeff's first film, sitting on my desk because I was actually talking. I was talking to Michael Shannon's agent about something, and he wanted me to see this this piece of work that Michael had done. And my then assistant, Morgan Pollitt, saw it sitting on my desk and said, that's an amazing movie. Have you watched that yet? And I was like, no, how do you know this movie? And she happened to be a fan of Jeff's brother, Ben Nichols' music and his band, Lucero, who did the music for the movie. So she's like, well, I came to it through that, but it's amazing. So I watched it that night. And then I called this guy up and I was like, what can I do to help you? Who are you? <laughs> what, what do you need? What can I do? So yeah, I totally stalked him after that. <laughs> Um, so, in, uh, in one of, you had the keynote address at the Sanders Annual Producers Lunch a few years ago, and um, you said to your fellow producers, be as generous as you can be. I what did, did you mean? 
I meant give me your money. <laughs> And be really, really generous. No, I, 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 I talked about what we just talked about, which was how many people really paved the way for me and were really generous. I mean, Peggy Reisky, she didn't say, you don't know what you're doing. You'd better learn it. She said, uh, I'm going to teach this other guy how to break down a script and do a budget and schedule. Do you want to come just to reinforce what you already know? And I'm like, oh, you know, oh, my God, yeah, there's a, there's a method. You know, cool. Um, so, I mean, people like that were so generous with me. I, I really believe in the whole process, and I believe in the apprenticeship business. I think this is an apprenticeship business. You need to prove yourself. You need to make yourself invaluable, and you will get work. There is a lot of work to be had, and we all want people that are, are lovely to be around and that can get things done. And th there's so many kinds of people that, that, could, that could fit that bill you need to you know, stand out and, and, and prove yourself. So I, I feel so strongly about having benefited from it and, and I try to really give back whenever I can. If a friend, somebody who's worked for me, people I know ask me questions, I really try to help and be there for them. Um, I, do, I mentor somebody out of Sundance every year. Um, and uh, I just, I don't know, I just really believe in it. Everybody has their own style and you have to find your own style, but you know, you always, there's always questions that need answering. And if you have somebody like I had Peggy and then Maggie Renzi to ask, you know, um, your life just gets a lot easier. You, you know, oftentimes you actually know the answer. You just want somebody to tell you, yeah, that'll work, you know? Do you, do you still go to them when you feel frustrated or? Oh, yeah. They're, they're both great friends. I spoke in Peggy's, Peggy teaches at NYU now. I spoke at her class just a few couple weeks ago. We had a ball catching up. And Maggie and I are friends, and we talk to each other about the changing world of financing and marketing and distribution and how we get through it. So, yeah, we constantly are. And I have a producer's group that I really believe in. This is the best thing that ever happened to me. Meg LaFauve, who's an amazing, uh, she's now a writer. She was a producer back at the time. She used to run Jodie Foster's company, Egg Pictures. Um, started a group in Los Angeles of producers, just a support group. And um, uh, they were the nicest people. She invited me to join, and I went to a lunch and said, who are you guys, and how does this work? And I was taught that this group has a sole function of supporting each other 100%, cone of silence over everything, you know, not just like advice, but introductions, insight into agents and actors and just all that kind of stuff you really need to ask people, but you can't, people won't know, speak publicly about it. So everything we do is complete cone of silence. Our whole thing is to be as generous with each other as we can be and help each other get our movies made. And the group is called Free Shoes because if we help each other get a movie greenlit, we aren't allowed to ask for producing credit, but we get a pair of free shoes. And we really like our shoes, so we work really hard. So, are these shoes one of these? They're not, but I have several pairs of free <laughs> shoes. And when one of us, oh, this is, a, we have a new tradition, which is when somebody gets an Oscar nomination, it actually started when I got nominated for Tree of Life, we make uh, a, a pair of running shoes, like Nike, you know, those Nike ones that you can personalize, and we, we do a special pair of running shoes with, like, free shoes along the back. It's, they're oh. very cool. We had two of them this year. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> It's important to have one's priorities. <laughs> um, so, um, what are, just going back to the beginning, um, what are a few films other than um, the two Malik films that marked you, mm. that, you know, made you want to, you know, be involved with cinema? and make a difference? Hmm. <laughs> I, I knew the answer until you asked that last question. <laughs> until you said make a difference. OK, but I'll tell you the couple of films that very much marked me. So it's the 70s. I'm figuring out film. I'm realizing that it, I like it. I've been really, really into music for since I was a teenager. And I, I suddenly realized that film might be more of a world for me because um, it used everything. I loved film because it was visual and audio. And there's sound. Audit, you know, sound editing and there's music and it just worked on so many levels that I thought it was the most total experience. But I came to it through being like a music fan, a rock and roll kid. And um, 
So probably one of the first movies that I saw 12, 15 times in a row was The Man Who Fell to Earth. David Bowie. Wow. I mean, you know, you can't. Who, who doesn't love that movie? I watched it over and over. And after you watch it a certain number of times, you start to understand a little bit about the filmmaking. And Nicholas Rogue is no slouch. So I started watching, and I watched. I watched the little jokes in there, and the little innuendo, little asides to the audience. And the, I just, it was a magnificent film. And another film that came out not that long afterwards um, was also kind of music driven. It's a very dark punk rock story that Dennis Hopper wrote and directed called Out of the Blue um, with Linda Mance. I don't know if you guys know this film, but it's extraordinary. And Linda Mance, who's the little girl from Days of Heaven, stars as this kid whose dad, played by Dennis Hopper, is just getting out of jail after being there for years, having hit a school bus full of kids and killed them when he was drunk driving with her in, the, in his semi. And it's just a really dark opening. She goes and she's like obsessed with Sid Vicious and Elvis. And um, it's kind of an extreme punk rock statement, but I loved it at the time. I don't know if I could still watch it because it is as dark as dark gets, but it really marked me at the time, and I was like, that's intense, that's crazy. You know, and I, I, I got obsessive, and then I used to watch things over and over again. Mm. And both of, the, uh, of those films are quite difficult, actually. You know, it's not easy if fair. Light. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in fact, one time when I was in college in the midst of my Man Who Fell to Earth marathon, I was really burning the candle at both ends and I got mononucleosis and I, I, I fell feverish to the floor one day in my, in my dorm room and got dragged off to the hospital and passed out and I woke up to this sur you know, doctor looking down at me strangely trying to figure out if I was awake and what was going on. And I, I looked up in my fever delirium and said, I can't go back. I can't go back. <laughs> <laughs> Which, if you've seen the film, makes sense. That's great. So, um, your favorite bands? Oh, too many to name. Too many. We could be here all day. We could have a seminar on that if you guys want. <laughs> But I can tell you, if I had to choose one, and like one artist to listen to just their work for the rest of my life, it'd have to be Tom Waits. Like, I love Tom Waits. I love his gravelly voice, and I love his writing, and I love his weird poetry, and I love his strange jazz, and, and I love his cover stuff. Like, if, if you guys have ever heard his cover version of, um, uh, what's it called, from West Side Story, you know? There's a place for us, that song. I'm not going to sing it for you because that would be really awful. But it's killer. He does it so well. It's like this gravelly voice. You know? There's a place for us. <laughs> it just kills me. I love this guy. So, yeah, I've never met him, and somebody else stalk him too. Uh, that's really interesting that, that um, his, his music um, shares lots of the qualities, he has so much kinship with the movies that you're producing, if you really Never think about, about that. it. Dark. I think that once, no, it's, you know, very tender and and dark and light at the same time. And no, it's true, it's true. And it, it, because there's such beauty, like that song is really delicate, even though it's his mm -hmm. Tom Waitsy, gravelly male world. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, who uh, who's not unlike that, who I love is, I talked about it earlier, Ben Nichols, Jeff's brother, has got that, that kind of voice and that kind of, he's a really, really good songwriter. Mm -hmm. And I could listen to his music all day. And actually once uh, one develops taste for something, I think that taste, you, as, as a way that we approach the world, it's just something that uh, goes across board, arts, shoes, uh, <laughs> songs. This is your delicate. <laughs> Yeah, they're delicate and tenacious at the same time. <laughs> I learned that from my shelter dogs. <laughs> I work with a lot of pit bulls and bulldogs and mm -hmm. never let go. So, you know, important words in your dictionary. Um, fun, right? Definitely. Uh, generosity. Yep. Um, trust. Yeah, big one. So, 
How does it work? I mean, it's it's definitely one of your principles, or one of your of the way that you know we were talking before about having a compass. Yeah, yeah, that's true. When Trust is really at the heart of it, I think. Mm -hmm. Because then you can do anything as long as you know you're going to get honesty from the people you're working with about what's going on and what's important and what's less so. And I don't know. It just it, everything is solvable if you're being straight with each other. Because there are a thousand hundred million things that are going to go wrong on a movie mm -hmm. every day, and, or things that didn't work, or things that yeah just didn't happen. And if you trust each other to know that you all have the same goal in mind. And for me, that is supporting the one vision. There's a singular vision. I know everyone thinks we're all, you know, we're all, we're all a huge part of it. But it's all about the writer-director for me. And that's really why I believe, and as much as I can, I try to work with people who both write and direct. Because again, that's such a singular vision. Um, that's what I'm there to support. And I, I find people whose work I, I get on many levels and that's that's who I want that's those are the kind of people I want to align with mm -hmm. and when we hit that trust place you know um, it's sort of nothing you can't do you know uh, if I don't if someone doesn't feel secure enough to be open and honest about what's going on or if they're they have another agenda it'll never work you never work as a partnership or as a team because you're not you don't have the same goals Mm -hmm. But the people that we surround ourselves, I mean, I, you know, on Jeff's films, we've just, every film, we just get happier and happier because there's, like, yet another piece of the puzzles fit in, you know? Like, he brought some really key people with him from the start. Um, when I met him and started to work with him, his DP and his designer were already part of his team. You know, and little by little, we added his editor, we added, you know, a costume designer, we've added different people in casting. And it's like, we just, it's, it's, the trust gets better, the goal, because we're all there to support. We all really trust his vision, and, and, it, and it strikes us at our own core. It's not, like, it's not like we're just going along for the ride. It's that we all believe in that story, that heart, that you know, take on the universe. And um, so, we are, so our goals are wholly aligned. And you know, people, there's always, in movie sets, there's always a lot of us and them. And, you know, the crew thinks the production's hiding money or the, the studio thinks you're doing something that they don't know about and all that stuff. And it's just like, we don't do it that way. We're very open book. I'm open book with the studio or a bond company or the crew. If anybody wants to know anything about how we're working, I'll tell them or show them because it's in all of our interest. And the more aligned we are, the smoother the process and the more fun. <laughs> uh, but that means also that then another word in your uh, personal uh, vocabulary is uh, immense patience. Say that again? Pa patience. Patience. Uh -huh. You know, to be able to go through all of these stages and um, add to the puzzle. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes, you know, some things, some things come together very quickly and other ones you just have to wait. It just, mm -hmm. they're going to happen when they're, when the universe is going to will them to happen. And, I mean, Terrence Malick is known for his, you know, long process. Mm -hmm. And you as a producer need to support this, uh, adjust to the different rhythms, you know, moving between, um, at the same time, like two or three films that, that you guys are doing in parallel. How, how difficult is that? Or how fun? <laughs> <laughs> well, it is one of the, I think, most important parts of my job as a producer is to understand how a director works and support their particular style of working. Don't I don't try to change it. I try to understand it and support it. Um, and everybody comes at it differently. You know, um, Julie Taymor's work on a given day or what she needs from me is quite different than Karin Kusama or Terry Malik or any anyone I've worked with, David Mamet. So I I, I Part of it becomes just time that we spend together before we're actually on a set. I try to make sure there's enough understanding of like what their concerns are that I can meet them, and then it's just you, then it's trial by error. You just figure it out as you go. You know, Terry told me things before we made the New World that 
I remember thinking, oh, that's so cool. That's such a good idea. Like, the script isn't really the center of it. You know, he gave me a script this big and had me help him edit it down to something that was more reasonable for financing and being a sort of, you know, um, Bible to what we were going to do. But none of that went away. You know, on the day, those pages that were edited out came right back out of that little file. And, you know, and we shot everything. So I learned very quickly, ah, okay, it's all going to happen. I'm not going to edit it. it I just need to make sure there's enough time for everything. And he told me, I don't want to use, you know, um, lighting. I want to use natural light. And I I really want to trust that. And, we you know, we hired um, Chivo Lubeski, Emmanuel Lubeski, to shoot. That was our first film altogether. And he was excited about it, too. But neither of us actually believed Terry. Like, <laughs> we spent <laughs> so much time and money burying cable in the whole, in you know, the Indian camp and under the, <laughs> under the little huts and the, you know. And we just, we had truckloads of stuff. We had it all, like, there so that, you know, we could... We could put a big HMI down the smoke hole in the in the main, you know, gathering, you know, uh, tent in the Indian area. That all went away. Like two, three weeks in, it was just ripped it all out and sent it back. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I guess he wasn't kidding, you know. So you just you have to kind of you just you learn it as you go, and then you start. To, and I trusted that he actually knew what he was doing. You know, Chivo was like walking around with his head in his hands, going, "I would never work again," <laughs> you know, because Terry wouldn't let him light anything. But you know. Then they started again. They learned to trust that <laughs> Shiva learned that Terry was never going to betray him by putting something in that he didn't think was worth it, that mm -hmm. he didn't think looked good, and therefore he was, you know, he trusted Terry and decided to get really bold in, in the way he shot. And that whole dogma that they created, you know, you guys have all seen it. Whatever movies you've watched, anything that Shiva shot since the New World, it's like that style has evolved more and more and more. And it's because they just decided to trust in, mm -hmm. in letting go of, you know, like, let's just, let's burn the bridges, you know? Mm -hmm. So trust and letting go. So basically you, you keep adjusting, you're being flexible, but at the same time, you try to put your gaze on the, on what the ultimate uh, objective is exactly without and being distracted by like little things that could exactly everyone has their own way of getting there you know Jeff Nichols writes a very tight script and we shoot exactly that like you can read that script you know exactly what the film is going to feel and look like and sound like Terry writes kind of ideas and then and then there's so many ways to get to it we, the exact story with the exact characters gets told but the process is very open and the end product gets you where you started, but in a way you didn't necessarily expect. Mm -hmm. So you, you learn, you know, uh, there's a different way of, you know, obviously we have to be responsible. We have a budget and we have a schedule and all those things. So we, ha we had to come up with a whole different way with Terry to, you know, meet those responsibilities. And I was, I'm close friends with Kurt Woolner, who runs one of the completion bond companies. And I just invited him out to Virginia and said, okay, we're going to kind of do this thing. And it's really different. And we're going to just kind of say this period of time you have these actors and this period of time you have this location and that's going to be our, that's going to be the thing that we keep to. You're not going to see scenes 12 through 14 shot today. You're going to see this part of the story has been told pretty much, although we might go back to it. But, you know, as long as we know we're, we're keeping to the, the structure that we came up with for him to, in, in order to keep an eye on ourselves and be responsible you know, that's how we're going to do it. And he said, good, sounds great. Just, you know, tell me if you have a problem. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess we can open it up to questions, but one last thing would be, uh, what's your advice for, um, you know, young emerging producers, filmmakers? I'm and sorry else. for you. No, I'm gonna, con sorry? sorry. And connected to that is, what's your um, what's your image of uh, the future of cinema? I'm gonna go with the first question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry for you all, you young emerging producers out there, because it is a much harder world than it was. There was I did come in through a window where, you know, there was like this sort of there was a lot of ways to finance a film and there was a struct financing structure that has worked for me for quite a long time. 
and it's changing by the minute, which is another reason I love partnering with Gonda on the Malik films because he's young and kind of got a handle on that stuff in a way that it's it's, it's incredible. But it's harder. It's um, the markets have changed. They've their European financing, which was always such a huge part of it, has become less viable or certainly less of a chunk of the budget. Um, you know, it's a risky, risky, risky business, and so investment in film is not easy, and and formulas change constantly. So. The main thing I would say is know why you're doing it, know what kind of stories you want to tell, what and you figure that out by just what you love, you know, what movies what movies you love, what stories you love, what what appeals to you. That's going to help you get to where those are. Don't try to get anything financed you don't believe in 100% because everyone's job is to say no to you. It's safer. It's less risky to not give you 10,000, 10 million whatever number of dollars, that's easier. And they're gonna probably say, whoever you're asking is probably gonna save their job by saying no to you before they're gonna take a risk saying yes to you. So you have to have an answer for every reason that they're gonna give you why not to do it. Um, and you know, I learned that the hard way. Uh, Cause I thought it was so easy after my lunch with Larry Estes. <laughs> You know, uh, and then I got shot down so hard. The next one, I was like, you know, I had Whoopi Goldberg attached to play a romantic lead in this movie, and Tom Rothman, who was running the Samuel Goldman Company at the time, said, "Frankly, Sarah, I do not see the appeal." And I was like, "Ah, right." It didn't have an answer. I just kind of crawled out of the room, like, "Wait, you're my new best friend. You just bought City of Hope at Sundance. You mean you don't want to do anything I want to do?" I was like, oh, "No." So um, that was a little, that was an eye opener. So yeah, passion, because it's a long road. Be sure it's ready, have that script, read it out loud, have actors read it out loud, because that's gonna tell you so much about what's working and what isn't working, where the lagging points are, where that dialogue is that doesn't actually sound like a person can speak it. Um, all those things will come out in a live reading and get your friends to help you. And then align with your friends, because the thing is, you're only as valuable as the material you have. And you know, a great way to be a producer is to have boatloads of money, because then you can hire really good writers and get good material. That's an awesome way to do it. Most of us don't have that. So you know, if you're in film school or you're starting, like, look around your fellow students and who can write, you know, and who can direct, who can do these things that you you know, because the, the best way to go out into the market is with a fully packaged these piece. You know, have a script, have a director, you know, have actors in mind. Those things are, are, are really hard to do, and it's really hard to get access. So the more you can create on your own with your team of people, the better you're going to be, the better off you're going to be. The future of cinema. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> I, I, I honestly have no idea. It terrifies me that people watch movies on a little screen this big. I want to rip it out of their hands and throw it across the room. But that's the world today. Uh, I, I'm like, bigger screen, better. You know, louder, better. That's my world. Um, and also shared. Yeah. You know, a shared experience. A collective. shared experience, totally. I mean, all that stuff is what I love. And I pray that, you know, there's somebody's gonna still be making strips of film in years to come, and somebody's still gonna be making sure that we're going to theaters. Um, but obviously the world is changing by the second, and one has to understand that. So you have to think about, yeah, how people watch the, watch the medium. But the bottom line is, here's what's never gonna change. It's all about telling stories, and you have to have a good story, and it has to be well told. And that's what gives people pleasure. And therefore, they will give you your money. Their, their money. <laughs> Going back to the essentials. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Um, Hi, yes. Uh, I went to the free screening of uh, Night of Cups uh, AFS last week, and I, All right. I can't wait to pay to see it again. Yeah. Uh, good on you. So that night, you mentioned your formula of you know, Terry Malick plus concept <laughs> plus this cast equals you know, X. So for an Austin filmmaker, Named Ben Blanchard, you know, what's your advice to uh, maybe a attract a producer or or money um, to a project and uh, visibility? Well, as I said again, it's there's so much risk involved. Anything you can do to lessen the risk 
is going to be on your side. So the first thing you need is a is a script, and that script had better be really really good, because we all read hundreds of scripts, and most of them aren't good. And you know, so you has to, it has to really stand out. It has to like appeal on every level and be something you think is really fully realized. That's the key. That's the that's a starting point. But then you still have to get access. Uh, Jeff Nichols wrote a letter to Michael Shannon when he was still a college student, saying, "I've written you a screenplay, but and I think you're the greatest actor working today. Please don't throw it out. Will you read ten pages?" And if you don't throw it out, we'll, we'll talk. But that's all I ask of you is to read 10 pages. And Michael, to his credit, because Jeff wrote a good letter, very important, write a great letter if you're going to try this. Um, short, to the point, hopefully slightly amusing, um, with good grammar and punctuation. Um, and, and so, yeah, and, so, and Mike, to his credit, said, all right, I'm going to give this guy 10 pages of my time. And then and he kept reading because Jeff's a damn good writer, and on he went. So then he had an actor, and then you know, then he 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 had a mentor in David Gordon Green, who they went to the same school he went to, and they'd worked on each other's films. And David said, "We'll meet my agent at CIA," which then brought him to Brian Brian Kavanaugh and Jones, and to me and to other people that helped him get his second film made. You know, after the first one. So. <clears throat> um, Agents are very tough to get to because they also have a million things on their plates. But there are young agents at every agency, and I encourage you, don't go for the big guns. Go for the new guys who are just, you know, the ones that are just out of the mailroom or just been promoted from one part to another from somebody's assistant. Their job is to find you. They've got to prove themselves as talent scouts. So you find, you know, again, and the networks are really important. Friends of yours you went to school with, stay in touch with them. If they moved to LA and went to work for somebody, stay in touch with them. Because they're gonna get you to that person that just got a job somewhere that's gonna help you get in there. And that stuff's so important, you know. Um, good letter, keep your connections, keep your friends close. Um, and then, and then yeah, find the young agent whose job it is, is to, to find you and Try to prove yourself to them. You know um, that stuff's all. The, and so agencies can help you get financed. If you're going to do it on your own, like Jeff made shotgun stories, figure out how to make, you know, write a project that is, can be done very, very inexpensively. Um, you know, Spike Lee's first film was three people in a room. You know, and that was a very smart way to start. Um, uh, you know, make sure it's viable so you can do it well. You know, um, you want it, to, this is going to be your calling card. You've got to get something. And, and again, if nobody's helping you, take a GoPro, take your iPhone, do something, make sure the writing's good, make sure the acting's good, and then you'll have something to show. You know, the good news is now everybody does have access to all, every short film on the planet. So then you just, then you've just got to, you know, find a film festival that has a short film program and, and try to get it in. Because again, they're looking for you. The festivals that specialize in shorts are looking for you guys. Um, so that's what you want to do. You don't want to try to jump into an area that you're not ready for. Get, get to somebody whose job it is to find you. Thank you very much. Sorry, that was very long-winded. Uh, hi. Uh, I'm kind of starting in the same situation as you. Uh, I'm an accounting major, but I really, really enjoy all the film stuff. So I was wondering, during your time in school, what was your thought process about being one major but wanting to do something else and any advice you could give for that process? Well, you know, accounting is a great background for especially being a producer. Um, I wished I had gotten a business degree and now that in the long run it would have been very helpful to me. So all that stuff's good. Understanding how money works, understanding how business works is fantastic. Still doesn't mean you can't do what you want to do. I mean, I was going to school but weekends, nights, whatever, I was interning, working on anything that came through Boston at the time. So... I really believe in that. Anybody you know is making something or wherever you live, a movie comes to town, offer yourself for free and make yourself invaluable. That you can, you'll learn so much in any position because as long as you observe and you, and you listen and you see who's doing what, then you start to figure out what you can be good at and, you know, or just simply observing if you want to be a writer or a producer or a director, see how other people are doing it, get as much access as you can. But do anything anyone asks you. Don't get you know sort of snobby about what you're willing to do because you don't know what you're going to learn or who you're going to meet, you know. And all those years that I was flailing around trying to figure out what the heck to do in this business that I really wanted to be a part of, 
I was doing that. I was making friends and watching people work and thinking what looked interesting and what looked like my skill set might suit, you know. And all those people I'm still really close to that I, I made friends with back then. Thank you. So very quickly, about 20 years ago, you were making a movie, Spanish Prisoner, in the Florida Keys. And I was a young film commissioner. All right. Rita Brown. Yeah, of course. Hi. Hi. And you guys were so generous to me. I'm so, so glad. That was, that was just really wonderful. And congratulations on your terrific career. Thank you so much. It would have been really embarrassing if you said I was mean to you. <laughs> Well, thank you. We have to wrap it up. Thank you so much. All right. Thank Sarah. you all for coming. This was great.